space. The final frontier. Come with us as we explore and unravel the mysteries of what lies beyond our planet Earth. Strap yourself in. Get your spacesuits ready as we prepare for takeoff in T minus five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Inside Outer Space. Apollo 11. It is perhaps one of the most famous space missions of all time. Today, let's discuss the Apollo 11 space mission. Apollo 11 is the first space mission that has landed the first two humans on the moon. On July 20, 1969, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin successfully landed the Eagle Lunar Module at 20 hundred hours 18 minutes UTC. As the story goes, it was Neil Armstrong who became the first person to step on the moon. He was followed shortly by Buzz Aldrin some 20 minutes later. Together, they spent approximately 2.25 hours on the moon's surface. There was a third person to the crew who remained in the command module Columbia in the moon's orbit while Aldrin and Armstrong stepped on the moon. The third person from their crew is none other than fellow astronaut Michael Collins. Apollo 11 was not the first of its kind. Actually, it was the fifth mission launched by NASA's Apollo program. Apollo 11 was launched into outer space via a Saturn V rocket from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida on July 16, 1969. The spacecraft itself has three main parts, the command module, the service module, and the lunar module. Let's take a look. The command module is the main module and it contains the cabin which can house three astronauts. It is also the only module that landed back on Earth. The service module, on the other hand, contains the components responsible for providing the astronauts with propulsion, electricity, oxygen, and water. Finally, the lunar module is a two-stage transportation module that allowed the astronauts to land on the moon and launch off its surface. It took the Saturn V rocket around three days to reach the moon's orbit. Upon reaching lunar orbit, Armstrong and Aldrin then transferred to the lunar module Eagle and landed in the area called the Sea of Tranquility. After exploring and staying on the moon's surface for 21 hours, they used the lunar module to leave the moon and rejoin with Collins in the command module. The pair also brought with them around 21.5 kilograms or 47 pounds of lunar material to bring back to Earth. The lunar module Eagle was eventually jettisoned in space as the command module performed maneuvers on course back to Earth. The trio successfully returned to Earth on July 24, landing safely in the Pacific Ocean. As this was happening, the moon landing was broadcast on TVs across the Earth to an international audience, which people fondly remember with a quote from Neil Armstrong, One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The Apollo 11 effectively ended the space race, a period of geopolitical tension during the Cold War era, where the USA and the USSR were competing to develop space travel and send humans in space. Kuiper Belt 
we've talked about our solar system's asteroid belt, an area in between Mars and Jupiter occupied by large space debris. Today, however, let's talk about another region, this time extending from the orbit of Neptune. It's located somewhere around 50 astronomical units away from the Sun. The Kuiper Belt is a circumstellar area that goes beyond the known planets. It's a lot like the asteroid belt, which consists of small to large bodies and space debris that are remnants of the creation of the solar system around 4.6 billion years ago. Most of the space debris comprising the Kuiper Belt are frozen chunks of methane, ammonia, and water. The Kuiper Belt is said to be approximately 20 times bigger than the asteroid belt. The Kuiper Belt is also home to three recognized dwarf planets, Haumea, Makemake, and the most famous of them all, Pluto. Pluto, of course, was previously classified as a planet, but was later reclassified as a dwarf planet in 2006. Scientists also theorized that some of the solar system's moons, such as Neptune's Triton and Saturn's Phoebe, may have originated somewhere in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt got its name from the Dutch-American astronomer Gerard Kuiper, although he did not solely predict its existence. Sometimes, the Kuiper Belt is also called the Edgeworth Kuiper Belt in recognition of another scientist, Kenneth Edgeworth, who also came up with his own ideas behind its existence. Objects observed at the Kuiper Belt are called KBOs, or Kuiper Belt Objects. The first KBO was observed in 1992 by Dave Hewitt and Jane Liu. KBOs are usually named after the gods and goddesses of different mythologies. Eris, for example, is named after the Greek goddess of discord and strife. Haumea, on the other hand, is the Hawaiian goddess of fertility and childbirth. Comets discovered on the Kuiper Belt, on the other hand, are usually named after the surnames of the people who discovered them. In 2006, scientists discovered a KBO that initially appeared to be 10% larger than Pluto. This object, called 2003 UB313, or Eris, is said to orbit the Sun once in 560 years and is estimated to have a varying distance of 38 to 98 AU. Since the discovery of Eris, astronomers sought to classify if Eris were to be named as the 10th planet in the solar system. Eventually, the International Astronomical Union reclassified Eris as well as Pluto and the asteroid Ceres into a category of their own as dwarf planets. In 2015, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft became the first man-made object to fly past Pluto and give us a glimpse of the Kuiper Belt. Uranus, the seventh planet from the Sun, coming in with a diameter of 51,118 kilometers or 31,763 miles and a mass of 8.68 times 10 to the 25th power kilogram or 4.184 times 10 to the 27th power pounds, equal to the mass of 15 Earths with 27 moons, 13 rings, and an orbit period of 30,687 days or 84 years, with a temperature of approximately negative 216 degrees Celsius or negative 356.8 degrees Fahrenheit. It is one of the coldest planets in the solar system. 
Welcome to Uranus. Uranus was officially discovered by musician and astronomer Sir William Herschel in 1781. It is said that before Herschel's time, the planet would have been too dim to be observed by the ancient people of the past. Actually, Herschel first thought that he discovered a comet and only confirmed that Uranus was a planet after a few years have passed. Uranus turns on its axis once in 17 hours and 14 minutes. It rotates in a retrograde fashion, which means that it rotates the opposite direction of Earth. A year in Uranus is equivalent to almost 84 Earth years. Uranus is also known as an ice giant. It has an upper layer of hydrogen and helium. Below this layer is an ice mantle that covers a core made up of rock and ice. The upper atmosphere of Uranus is made up of water, ammonia, and iced methane crystals giving the planet a bluish color. Uranus is said to be one of the coldest planets with its minimum atmospheric temperature of negative 224 degrees Celsius or negative 371 degrees Fahrenheit. Uranus also has two sets of thin rings. These are comprised of 11 inner rings and two outer rings. As of 1986, only the Voyager 2 spacecraft has flown by Uranus with a distance of 81,500 kilometers or 50,641.7 miles, showing us close-up images of the planet, its moons, and rings. SETI It's a true and tried trope in most science fiction. But let's stop and ask ourselves, are we really alone in the universe? While there are still no definitive answers to that question, this however does not stop the curiosity of amateur enthusiasts and seasoned astronomers alike to seek out life beyond our planet. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence or SETI is the collective term used to describe the collective scientific endeavor of looking for intelligent life in outer space. And no, it is not science fiction. Let's look at a quick history of SETI. The search for intelligent life beyond our own came about at the start of the space age in 1957. This was the year that the Soviet Union successfully launched Sputnik, the first artificial Earth satellite. Just two years after Sputnik 1, physicists Philip Morrison and Giuseppe Cocconi from Cornell University published an article on the possibilities of radio communication in space. Naturally, this led to curiosity as scientists, both professional and amateur alike, showed interest to probe the stars for possible radio communication sent by other intelligent life forms from across outer space. In April of 1960, a young radio astronomer from West Virginia, USA, by the name of Frank Drake, created his own 26-meter radio telescope to look for transmissions in space. He spent several weeks listening for any signs of extraterrestrial signals. This project came to be known as Project Ozma and is considered one of the first modern SETI research projects. Today, there have been at least 98 more SETI projects launched around the world since Project Ozma. NASA became interested in SETI at around the 1970s and it launched its own SETI research in 1988 and started observations in 1992. Unfortunately, NASA's SETI research was cut short the following year due to a U.S. Congress decision. The SETI Institute, on the other hand, was founded in 1984 in California, USA. The Institute aimed to facilitate SETI research as well as educational programs related to life in the universe. The SETI Institute also managed to get private funding to continue some of NASA's SETI research. The SETI Institute launched Project Phoenix, a 100-day project stretched across five and a half years, constantly monitoring the sky 
for extraterrestrial signals. The University of California, Berkeley also has its own SETI project named Serendip. On the other side of the world, there's also the independent research group, SETI Australia Center from the University of West Sydney. Both of these groups have been working together to comb through all channels and radio transmissions in space. So, are we really alone in the universe? Who knows the answer? But until then, the world's SETI researchers will continue to keep looking out for the answer. NASA Now, let's take a look at the most famous and arguably the most accomplished space research agency in the world. Today, let's talk about the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or more commonly known as NASA. NASA is an independent government agency under the executive branch of the U.S. federal government. Its primary responsibilities include the U.S. Civilian Space Program, along with aeronautics and aerospace research. NASA was actually founded in response to the early Soviet space achievements during the period known as the Space Race. NASA was formed from the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA. It was in 1958 when U.S. President Dwight Eisenhower established NASA by signing the National Aeronautics and Space Act. Since then, NASA has been at the forefront of spaceflight and aeronautics research. One of NASA's first high-profile projects was called Mercury, a project whose main focus was to learn if humans could survive in the environment of space. Mercury was then followed by Project Gemini, which sent two astronauts in space as research and preparation for a trip to the moon. Perhaps one of NASA's most famous projects is the Apollo Project, a series of planned missions with the goal of sending humans into the moon. Project Apollo eventually achieved this goal in July of 1969 with the Apollo 11 mission, followed by five more successful trips to the moon. This was also known as the landmark event that ended the space race and paved the way for the international cooperation in space research. Among other things, NASA also pioneered the space lab, the first suborbital space station, and the precursor to the International Space Station. Teaming up with the USSR, NASA also launched the Apollo Soyuz test projects in the 1970s. NASA then refocused efforts on the space shuttle program from the 1970s through the 1980s. This project used a reusable spacecraft which features a space plane and large detachable rockets. This eventually developed into the Shuttle Mir program when both the US and Russian governments collaborated on a series of space missions in the 90s. International cooperation with other agencies in the 90s led to the development and launch of the International Space Station, to date the biggest habitable man-made satellite in Earth's low orbit. Lastly, let's take a look at some of NASA's unmanned spacecraft developed to go beyond Earth and send valuable data back to our planet. Today, NASA has launched over a thousand unmanned space missions. Some notable examples are the Explorer 1, launched in 1958. It is the first unmanned U.S. satellite. Mariner Program, a series of unmanned space missions that sent space probes to study Mars, Venus, and Mercury. Viking 1, launched in 1976, the first successful unmanned spacecraft to land on Mars. Galileo, the first unmanned craft to probe Jupiter's atmosphere. The Legal Status of Space Here is an interesting question. Ever wondered who owns the places that people discover in space? Who owns outer space even? 
Let's talk about space law. The law that encompasses national and international guidelines governing activities in outer space. Before we start, it is important to take note, however, that no one nation owns space. And since nations are independent with each other, there's also no one accepted legal take on space law. However, there are a couple of international conventions that most nations have signed and agreed upon. The Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States and the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies or more commonly known as the Outer Space Treaty, is an international treaty that forms the basis of space law. It was opened for signatures in the US, UK, and Soviet Union on January 27, 1967, and took effect in October of the same year. Currently, the 107 nations are party to the treaty, with another 23 nations who are signatories. Some of the key points of the treaty include the ban on placing weapons of mass destruction in Earth's orbit, or installing any and all such weapons in the Moon, or any other celestial body. It also prohibits weapons testing in space, or any such celestial body. The treaty also includes provisions that prevent any government from laying claim to any natural resource in space, and also prohibits governments to claim sovereignty over territories in space. Fermi Paradox Here's something to ponder about, the existence of life as we know it, given that there is a very high probability for intelligent life to exist beyond our planet. With the observable universe having a diameter of about 90 billion light years, with galaxies numbering into billions, each of them having billions of stars as well, with an estimated number of planets to be in the trillions, there's plenty of possibility for any one of these places to harbor and foster life. But the question is, where is everybody? This is the very basic premise of the Fermi Paradox, named after physicist Enrico Fermi. The paradox was devised because of the so-called contradiction of not having any evidence of intelligent life in the universe, in spite of the overwhelmingly high probability. To sum up, here are the arguments put forth by Fermi. Number 1. There are billions of stars in the galaxy. Some of these stars are even billions of years older than Earth. Number 2. There is a high probability that some of these stars would have nearby Earth-like planets capable of developing intelligent life. Number 3. Some of these Earth-like planets may have the capability to develop interstellar travel, which is something that the people of Earth are developing at the moment. And number 4. Given that planets are far away, the Milky Way can still be traveled in a mere couple of million years. Fermi then argues that if there is intelligent life out there, well why have they not visited Earth yet? And thus, the mystery that is the Fermi Paradox is born. True enough, even with Earth's SETI or search for intelligent life research on the way, there still has been no convincing proof of alien life. However, there may be a few theories that can explain the Fermi Paradox. Some are novel, while some are quite bizarre. Let's take a look. Maybe extraterrestrial life is rare or non-existent. It's also possible that other intelligent species have not arisen yet. 
Another possible explanation could be that aliens have yet to create technology that is suitable for interstellar travel. Some theorists suggest that maybe it's in the nature of intelligent life to destroy itself or perhaps destroy other intelligent life forms by means of war or pollution perhaps. Maybe it's a natural progression of life to become extinct by way of natural events just like what happened with the dinosaurs. Or perhaps intelligent life is just too far away. Some suggest that humans might not have the capabilities yet to communicate with alien life. Or maybe intelligent alien life just wants to isolate itself and be left alone. Whatever the reason is, human understanding and science are a long ways ahead. Until then, we can only wonder if we truly are alone in the universe. Solar Wind Can you imagine a type of wind? that's created by the power of nuclear reactions by the sun itself. Today, let's talk about the phenomenon called solar winds. Solar winds were first observed in the 17th century. Astronomers noticed that comets' tails always seem to point away from the sun, regardless of which direction the comet is taking. Solar winds begin at the sun's outer layer, called the corona. The corona can reach temperatures up to 1.1 million degrees Celsius, or 1.7 million degrees Fahrenheit. When this happens, the sun's own gravity can no longer hold on to rapidly moving charged particles, comprised of protons, electrons, and plasma, as these particles move away from the star. Solar winds are primarily ejected through holes in the sun's magnetic field. These holes are called coronal holes. Other factors such as disturbances on the surface of the sun also affect the speed and strength of solar winds. Solar winds can reach speeds up to 800 kilometers per second or 2 million miles per hour. As the solar wind reaches the Earth, it carries charged particles and electromagnetic waves being emitted in all directions. If the materials carried by the solar wind would reach Earth's surface, it could do some damage. But luckily, the Earth's own magnetic field provides shielding. Earth's magnetic field redirects emissions from solar winds to move around the planet. In contrast, Earth's moon, which has no atmosphere, bears the full effect of the radiation from the solar wind. In some instances, the sun releases a large amount of plasma bursts, which are known as CMEs or coronal mass ejections. CMEs are very powerful and they carry large bursts of radiation affecting Earth's magnetic field. Charged particles move through Earth's magnetic poles, causing light displays known as auroras. Disruptions in the Earth's magnetic field due to CMEs can also be a cause of interference. With regards to Earth's broadcast and communication signals, as well as navigation tools dependent on the Earth's magnetic field. NASA's Ulysses mission, which was launched in October 6, 1990, is responsible for studying the Sun at various latitudes. It has been measuring the properties of solar winds for more than a dozen years now. Another satellite that is studying the Sun and solar winds is the Advanced Composition Explorer or ACA which was launched in 1997. The ACE keeps orbit around the Lagrange point, an area where the gravity from the Sun and Earth is equal. 
thus keeping ACA in a stable orbit. ACA is responsible for measuring solar winds with real-time measurements on the constant flow of particles. Neptune, the eighth planet from the Sun, coming in with a diameter of 49,528 kilometers or 30,775 miles and a mass of 1.02 times 10 to the 26th power kilogram or 2.258 times 10 to the 26th power pounds equal to the mass of 17 Earths with 14 moons and 5 rings and an orbit period of 60,190 days or 164.8 years with a temperature of approximately negative 214 degrees Celsius or negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the farthest planet of the solar system. Welcome to Neptune. Neptune was discovered in September 23, 1846 by Ornan Leverrier and Johann Gall. Because of its vast distance, it was only in the 1800s that the presence of Neptune was determined by use of mathematical predictions. The planet spins on its axis at such a fast rate at 18 hours. Neptune is considered as an ice giant, but it is actually the smallest of them all. Despite its smaller size, Neptune is actually more massive than the planet Uranus. Its atmosphere is composed of hydrogen, helium, and traces of methane. The methane is responsible for absorbing much of the red light that hits the planet, thus making it appear blue. The climate on Neptune can be described as very active. Large storms constantly appear throughout the planet, with winds going as fast as 600 meters per second. A storm recorded in 1989 called the Great Dark Spot even lasted around five years on the planet. As of today, there is only one spacecraft that has flown by Neptune. That would be the Voyager 2. Besides the images of Neptune from Voyager, scientists used the Hubble Space Telescope and various ground-based telescopes to observe and study the planet. The Great Red Spot It is perhaps the most prominent feature of the planet Jupiter the Great Red Spot. The Great Red Spot was first observed in 1664 by Robert Hooke and then by Giovanni Cassini in the following year. Cassini described it as a permanent spot and since then, this permanent spot was observed from 1665 to 1713 by other astronomers. Then came a 118-year-old gap until the Great Red Spot has been observed again in 1830. Some speculate that the spot observed in the early 1600s is the same as the one observed in the 1800s. And if so, this confirms that the Great Red Spot has been on Jupiter for about 350 years. In 1979, the Voyager 1 spacecraft became the first man-made object to take detailed up-close pictures of Jupiter. It is said that the Great Red Spot is actually a storm on Jupiter. It can be found 22 degrees south of the equator. It has an oval shape and spins at a counterclockwise fashion. Each rotation is roughly the same period as six Earth days. It measures 16,350 kilometers or 10,159.419 miles in width, which is about 1.3 times the width of the Earth. For comparison, the biggest storms on Earth are about 1,600 kilometers or 994 miles in width with a speed of 321 kilometers per hour or 199.4 miles per hour. The Great Red Spot appears to be rolling in between two bands of clouds on Jupiter, 
these two bands of gases are noticeable because of their differing colors. There's the brown band of clouds in the south equatorial belt, and then there's the whitish band in the south tropical zone. The great red spot has a cold temperature, although it has a warm core. A possible explanation for this is that cold air arises, therefore it moves upward the vortex as it expands and cools down. As the gases cool, it creates a thick cloud over the great red spot. Nobody knows for sure why the great red spot is red. Sometimes, the reddish hue of the spot varies from a dark brick red to a pale salmon color. Scientists theorize that the reddish color may be the result of a combination of complex organic compounds, red phosphorus, and some sulfur. The storm's long lifespan can be attributed to Jupiter being a gas giant. The absence of a solid planetary surface prevents the storm from waning due to friction. Recent observations of the spot in 2004 reveal that the spot is actually decreasing in width, and it is estimated that by 2040, the spot will have a circular appearance. In July of 2017, NASA's Juno spacecraft successfully passed over the Great Red Spot and has sent back photos to Earth. Orbit We've been discussing planets for a while now. Now, let's talk about planetary movement or orbit. The orbit is defined as the repeating path an object takes around another object. The object in the path is usually called a satellite. For example, the moon orbits around the Earth, so you could say that the moon is a satellite. As we previously discussed, satellites are not just naturally occurring objects, but they can be man-made as well. For example, we can look at satellites orbiting the Earth, like the Hubble Space Telescope. On a much wider scale, planets, comets, asteroids, and other objects in space also follow an orbit. The best example of this is the solar system, where the eight planets, including our own Earth, orbit around the Sun along with other celestial objects. Orbits come in different shapes. Although all orbits are elliptical, meaning they follow an ellipse, a round shape that is similar to an oval. Sometimes, ellipses can be circular as well. Planets usually have elliptical orbits closer to being circular, while comets, on the other hand, have elliptical orbits closer to the shape of an oval. In some cases, the orbit of satellites causes them to be closer and sometimes farther. The closest point that a satellite is to Earth is called perigee, while the farthest is called the apogee. For planets in orbit, the closest point to the Sun is called the perihelion, and the farthest is aphelion. Objects stay in orbit because of gravity. Gravity is the force that objects exert on one another. The more massive an object is, the more it exerts gravity on less massive objects. Take for example the Earth's moon, which is kept in orbit by the Earth. Or the solar system's planets, which are kept in orbit by the massive Sun. But why do objects stay in orbit and not get hurled off into space? Well, we have Newton's first law of motion to explain that. An object in motion will stay in motion 
unless something pushes or pulls it. The Sun exerts just enough gravity on Earth to keep it in orbit. It's like a constant tug of war between the satellite and the object that is pulling it back. The object's momentum and gravity must be balanced just right for a satellite to stay on orbit. If the forward momentum of an object is too much, it will move past the other object and will not stay in orbit. If on the other hand, the object's momentum is too little, the said object will be pulled down and will eventually crash towards the other. Donut-shaped planet We are so used to seeing planets with a spherical shape, but what if we told you that other planetary shapes are possible? That's right, given the right conditions, our understanding of physics says that a planet shaped like a toroid or donut is possible, however unlikely the probability may be. Anyway, scientists think that a donut-shaped planet may form given the following condition. If a planet spins fast enough, it may be able to generate enough centrifugal force at the equator to push the planet's sides outward, thus creating a donut shape. Of course, given this very unlikely scenario, it goes without saying that a donut planet is very unstable and can easily fall apart or be smushed into a spheroid given the slightest disturbance. So what's life like in a donut-shaped planet? Gravity in a donut planet is different from that of a spherical one. If this planet has any moons, the movement or orbit of its moon will also be different. Scientists think that the moon may move in a variety of ways, like around the planet in an elliptical fashion. The moon may also move through the planet's hole, like a figure 8 orbit. Now the sky might be different for people who are in the inner side of the donut planet. If they look up, they will not only see the sky and the stars, but they will also see the land from the other side of the donut's inner ring. Also, weather and climate is different in a donut planet. There will be times when the ring shape will completely block out the sun for some parts of the planet. If the donut planet does not have a tilt, the regions in the inner ring will mostly be dark and cold. And these are just some of the more peculiar things in a hypothetical donut planet. Think about it. Would you live in one? Milky Way It's the star cluster that we call home. Welcome to the Milky Way Galaxy. The Milky Way is a galaxy or a giant cluster of stars which our planet, the Moon, the Sun, and the rest of the solar system belong to. Its name comes from the fact that the huge amount of stars at night appear like bands of milk in the night sky. Before we dive in, let's talk about galaxies first. A galaxy is a gravity-bound system that is comprised of stars, planets, gases, dust, and other interstellar debris. Actually, the word galaxy itself comes from the Greek term galaxies, which literally means milky. This is in reference to the milky appearance of the Milky Way galaxy. In Greek mythology, it is said that Zeus placed his infant son Hercules on the goddess Hera to be breastfed. The Milky Way is said to have been formed from some of the milk that was spilled in the process. Galaxies can be categorized according to size and according to shape. Sizes can range from dwarf with a few hundred million stars to giants which has stars in the number of trillions. 
On the other hand, galaxies can also be classified into shape or morphology. Examples of which include spiral, elliptical, ring, lenticular, and irregular. Now let's zoom in a bit to the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy and it has a huge diameter which is approximately between 100,000 to 180,000 light years. It is estimated that the Milky Way contains somewhere between 100 to 400 billion stars with at least 100 billion planets. The solar system is located somewhere approximately 26,000 light years from the Milky Way's galactic center. The center of the Milky Way is marked by a high intensity radio source, which astronomers call Sagittarius A. Some scientists suggest that Sagittarius A may be a supermassive black hole and is responsible for creating the strong gravitational pull, thus keeping the stars in the Milky Way together. The Milky Way and nearby galaxies form a local group, which is called the Virgo Supercluster. On a clear night, we can see part of the Milky Way on Earth. It has a hazy white appearance, which can be viewed 30 degrees across the sky. On a side note, technically, all the stars visible on Earth is part of the Milky Way. On a clear night, however, the light from the Milky Way can be seen on Earth. But that's just a small part of it. That's because the Earth is so small compared to the size and mass of the Milky Way itself. Enceladus. It's one of the most studied moons this side of the solar system. Today, let's find out why as we talk about the moon named Enceladus. Enceladus is the sixth largest moon of Saturn. It has a diameter of approximately 500 kilometers or 310 miles. Enceladus itself is covered by fresh clean ice. This makes it one of the most reflective objects in the solar system. It has a surface temperature of negative 198 degrees Celsius or negative 324 degrees Fahrenheit. Enceladus orbits around Saturn with a period of 1.4 Earth days. Enceladus was discovered by William Herschel. If the name sounds familiar, well, you guessed it. William Herschel is the same person who discovered the planet Uranus, among others. Herschel used a 1.2 meter or 3.9 feet telescope, which was at the time considered as the largest in the world. Enceladus is named after Enceladus the giant from Greek mythology. Enceladus was the son of the goddess of the earth Gaia and the god of the sky Uranus. William Herschel decided to name his discovery after it at the insistence of his son John. And here's where it gets interesting. Scientists discovered something amazing when the Voyager spacecraft first took pictures of Enceladus in the 1980s. The pictures reveal that Enceladus has a clear icy surface. The icy surface on this moon gives it a very reflective appearance. You can think of it as a large space mirror. This feature is what makes Enceladus one of the brightest objects in our solar system. Further observations suggest that this moon may be composed of a rocky core, frozen ice water, and a frozen mantle. Additional examinations of the planet suggest cryovolcanic activity. This means that there may be active volcanoes underneath the icy surface of this moon.
as these interior volcanoes erupt. Small geysers appear as cracks on the icy surface of Enceladus. The Cassini spacecraft was able to take images of the geyser activity on the moon's surface during its close-up flybys of Enceladus from 2004 to 2015. Scientists think that the material ejected from these geysers form part of Saturn's rings called the E-ring. The volcanic activity and the presence of water in Enceladus leads many researchers to wonder if Enceladus can develop life or at the very least have the potential to be habitable by humans. If you think about it, Enceladus could potentially be a small Earth with its rocky core, volcanic activity, and icy oceans. For now, there have been some proposals to further explore Enceladus and perhaps even bring some samples from the Moon back to the Earth for further study. And who knows, maybe humans will be visiting or even living in Enceladus in the future. Saturn, the sixth planet from the Sun, coming in with a diameter of 120,536 kilometers or 74,897.6 miles and a mass of 5.68 times 10 to the 26th power kilogram or 1.253 times 10 to the 27th power pounds equal to 95 Earths with 62 moons and 30 rings and an orbit period of 10,756 days or 29.5 years with a temperature of approximately negative 178 degrees Celsius or negative 288 degrees Fahrenheit. It's the planet with the awesome ring system and is the farthest planet seen by the naked eye. Welcome to Saturn. Saturn is the fifth brightest object in the sky. It can easily be seen without the aid of telescopes. Saturn takes its name from the Roman god Saturnus. The planet has been known by the ancient people from Babylon and the Far East. Saturn is mostly composed of hydrogen layers that get denser as it gets closer to the planet's core. The core is said to be made of a metallic composition with a hot inner core. Saturn is a gas giant and has different layers of gases. Its atmosphere is divided into different bands of clouds that are composed of ammonia ice, water ice, cold hydrogen, and sulfur ice. Among the other planets, Saturn has the most elaborate ring system. The rings are mostly composed of ice and dust debris. The rings stretch out to more than 120,000 kilometers or 74,564.5 miles but are only 20 meters or 65.6 .6 feet thick. Saturn has many moons and some of its larger moons have been observed to have oceans below its icy surface. Today, there have been four spacecrafts that have visited Saturn. These are Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and the Cassini-Huygens mission. Tides Here's another example of interstellar bodies affecting each other. It's closer to Earth than you may think. So for today, let's talk about tides. Tides are the rise and fall of the water levels in the seas and oceans of the Earth. This rise and fall is caused by the Moon's gravitational force that it exerts on the Earth's waters. When the Moon is closer to Earth, its gravity exerts a pull on the Earth's surface. This gravity is less than the Earth. That's why the Earth does not get pulled in by the Moon. But it's enough to cause water in the seas and the oceans to rise. When the Moon's gravitational pull is at its highest, this results to what's called a high tide a period where ocean levels are high. On the other hand, when the moon's gravitational pull is at its lowest, 
This results into what is called the low tide, or the lowest water level of the tide. In case of a full moon or a new moon, the sun also affects the level of the tides together with the moon. During these phases, the high tides are at its highest and the low tides are at its lowest. These type of tides are known as spring tides and are especially strong because of the combined gravitational pull of the sun and the moon. During the moon's quarter phases, however, the sun and the moon are at right angles to each other. This causes some of their respective gravitational pull to cancel out each other. This results to a weak type of tide called neap tides. Since the Earth, Moon, and Sun move in a consistent pattern, tides can be accurately predicted. The ancient peoples of Earth have studied this extensively and have accurately predicted tides for hundreds of years. This is especially helpful for people living near coastal areas to prepare for rising water levels. Tidal data also helps seafarers with navigation, especially in areas that are shallow and narrow. Engineers are also reliant on tidal patterns and data when designing structures over bodies of water, like bridges and docks. Tidal data also helps small-scale industrial and recreational fish catching activities. Knowledge of tides helps improve the quality of catches as certain fish favor specific tidal conditions. Marine habitat restoration activities are also dependent on tidal activity. Tides also determine the flow of sea and ocean traffic, especially in active routes where many ships and vessels pass by. And finally, tidal data are also useful for sports and recreational activities in the oceans and seas. Eclipse Here's another interesting phenomena in space that you can observe right here on Earth. Today, let's talk about eclipses. So what are eclipses? Well, eclipses are the name given to the phenomenon when a celestial body, like the Sun, is obscured by another celestial body. This happens when a celestial object passes behind or in front of another object, thus obscuring the view and casting a shadow from the observer's viewpoint. The term eclipse actually comes from the Greek word eclipsis, which translates to abandon or darken. Before people knew what eclipses were, they used to associate eclipses with disaster and bad omens. In some cultures, eclipses were thought to be caused by giant monsters swallowing the sun. The most common type of eclipse that can be observed in the Earth is the solar eclipse. The solar eclipse occurs when the moon passes in front of the sun, slightly covering it as observed from the vantage point of Earth. Another type of eclipse is the lunar eclipse. This happens when the Earth blocks the Sun in reference to the Moon's position. Lunar eclipses can only happen during the full Moon, when the Moon is at the far side of the Earth. Because of this, a lunar eclipse can only be seen on one hemisphere of the Earth. When eclipses occur, there are usually shadows cast by the blocking object to the blocked object. The region of the blocked object is divided into three parts. There's the umbra, the area where the object completely blocks the light source. 
then there's the Antumbra. The area where the object is completely in front of the light source, but is too little to be able to cover the whole light source. And finally, there's the penumbra, or the region where the object is only partially blocking the light source. A total eclipse happens when an observer is inside the region of the umbra. On the other hand, when the observer is at the antumbra, the eclipse is called an annular eclipse. And lastly, the eclipse is called a partial eclipse when the observer is within the region of the penumbra. For lunar eclipses, only the umbra and the penumbra are visible. That's because of the size of the moon. From the moon's viewpoint, the Earth's apparent diameter is nearly four times that of the sun. Since ancient times, people have been keeping track of solar eclipses. The purpose of this is to serve as important markers or reference points with regard to solar events of the era. One of the earliest records for a solar eclipse comes from a Syrian tablet dated from 1223 BC. Another one can be found in an old Irish record from 3340 BC. Elsewhere, ancient Chinese astronomers have kept solar eclipse records for over 4,000 years. A look into the past. The telescopes that we have lets us look at objects light years away. When we look at objects in the sky, we are actually seeing it from a much earlier point in time. The effect is so that it is as if we are peeking into the past, much like how a hypothetical time machine does. But how? Well, consider this. Humans are able to see things because of the light that is reflected of our eyes. When light hits an object, it reflects back to our eyes and our brain processes the image. This is how we can see. Now this process of reflecting light happens at such a fast pace that we hardly ever notice it. But what if the light that we see needs to travel a far enough distance before it reaches our eyes and brains? Remember that light travels fast at a rate of 300,000 kilometers per second or 186,282.397 miles per second. The nearest star to Earth, the Sun, is still 149.6 million kilometers, or 92.96 million miles away. Even at the speed of light, light from the Sun will take around 298.6 seconds before it can even reach Earth exactly the time it takes for us to see sunlight. Enter the light here. The light here is a measurement of distance that is equivalent to the distance that light can travel in a year, which is somewhere along 9 trillion kilometers. So if something is a light year away, it would also take the light from that object exactly one year before it can be seen. For example, the nearest star cluster to our own Milky Way galaxy is the Andromeda galaxy. Andromeda is around 2.5 million light years away. Because it's 2.5 million light years away from Earth, the Andromeda galaxy that we are observing is the Andromeda galaxy as it was 2.5 million years ago. Spacewalk Imagine how astronauts float in space. That's exactly what spacewalks are. A spacewalk, or extravehicular activity, or EVA, is the term used to describe any activities that astronauts undertake in space outside any spacecraft. Spacewalks are done for a variety of reasons, which include conducting experiments in space, testing out new equipment, and conducting repairs on a spacecraft. 
The first person to do a spacewalk is the Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, which he did during March 18, 1965. The whole thing lasted 10 minutes. Meanwhile, the record for the most number of spacewalks is held by Russian astronaut Anatoly Solovyev. He's had a total of 16 spacewalks with a combined time of almost 82 hours. Of course, going on spacewalks requires tremendous preparation and training to be executed properly and safely. Astronauts on Earth start training for spacewalks by going swimming. Swimming is the closest thing to floating in space. Astronauts train in a large swimming pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Lab or NBL. This pool holds a really large amount of water, which is around 6.2 million gallons. The NBL is located near the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Another method of training for spacewalks involves virtual reality where space is simulated in a video game-like environment. This type of training involves a special helmet with screens on it and gloves that act as controllers. During the spacewalk, astronauts wear special spacesuits that allow them to breathe and provide protection and life support. Astronauts wear these space suits hours in advance before the spacewalk to prepare for pressurization and to introduce the body to breathing just pure oxygen. This is important as breathing only oxygen helps flush out nitrogen in the body. The presence of nitrogen during spacewalks creates gas bubbles that can cause pain in the body. This condition is called the bends because the pain is usually found in the joints of the body. As a side note, the same method of breathing in pure oxygen is also employed by scuba divers before going on dives to prevent the bends as well. Once the prep is done, astronauts exit the spacecraft through a special chamber called the airlock. The airlock has two doors that lock in air inside the spacecraft during entry and exit. Outside, astronauts are attached to safety tethers to make sure that they do not float off into space. The astronauts' tools are also attached via tether so they don't float away as well. The astronauts also have special jet thrusters in their suits. Just like a small jetpack that can help maneuver astronauts in space with a flick of a joystick. Oort Cloud What could be beyond our solar system? That is one of the questions that astronomers are still trying to figure out. Today, let's talk about a region that is theorized to be located way beyond our solar system and the Kuiper Belt. Let's discuss the Oort Cloud. The Oort Cloud is a region that is theorized to be the source of icy objects and debris well beyond the Kuiper Belt. It is described as a large shell containing icy objects located somewhere at the outermost part of the solar system. The name of the Oort cloud comes from the name of astronomer Jan Oort, who was the first to suggest the existence of such a region in space. This was in response to a query, where do most comets come from? The Oort cloud is said to be spherical, consistent with the laws of gravity. It is theorized that the particles in the Oort cloud are remnants of the materials and debris 
that formed the Sun and the planets during the birth of the solar system. The most widely accepted theory is that the materials from the Oort cloud formed part of the Sun at an earlier point in time. As the other planets formed and grew, these particles were pushed further away from the Sun as a result of the change in the gravitational influence of the solar system when the planets formed. It is also said that icy particles in the Oort cloud are easily disrupted by interstellar events such as the passing of a star, nebula, or an activity in the Milky Way. These activities tend to knock the icy material off the Oort cloud, sending them towards the Sun as comets. According to computations, the Oort cloud is probably located some 2,000 astronomical units from the Sun. Note that an AU is the distance of the Earth to the Sun. That's 149,598,000 kilometers or 93 million miles. It is estimated that there is around 2 trillion objects in the Oort cloud. In 2003, the planet Sedna was discovered and is thought to be part of the inner Oort cloud. Though still theoretical at this point, scientists continue to work on finding out what is beyond the solar system. Perhaps in the future, we can finally send space missions to verify the existence of the Oort cloud. Mercury The closest planet to the Sun coming in with a diameter of 4,879 kilometers or 3,031.6 miles and a mass of 3.30 times 10 to the 23rd power kilogram or 7.242 times 10 to the 23rd power pounds with zero moons and an orbit period of 88 days with a varying temperature of approximately negative 173 degrees Celsius to 427 degrees Celsius or negative 279 to 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It is our nearby neighbor and is the smallest planet in the solar system. Welcome to Mercury! Mercury was first discovered by Assyrian astronomers in the early 14th century BC. It is the smallest planet in the solar system and is one of the five planets that is visible to the naked eye. Compared to Earth's size, Mercury only comes across at approximately 4,879 kilometers across the equator, whereas the Earth measures 12,742 kilometers or 7,917.5 miles. Despite being smaller than Earth, however, Mercury is denser than the Earth. This is because Mercury is composed mainly of rock and metal. The planet has a molten core, which scientists suspect is composed of sulfur. Despite being the closest to the Sun, Mercury is only the second hottest planet in the solar system, next to Venus. The surface of the planet is covered in craters that are caused by many impacts with asteroids and comets. To date, there have been only two spacecrafts that have visited Mercury. This is because having a close proximity to the Sun makes Mercury especially harder to travel to. Mariner 10 was the first to fly by Mercury between 1974 to 1975. Then, in 2004, the Messenger probe became the second to visit the planet after almost 30 years. Spacesuit Let's talk about one of the most essential pieces of technology that astronauts use in space. 
the spacesuit. The spacesuit is more than just clothes for traveling in space. They're in fact a collection of different technological and engineering marvels that are combined together to help astronauts survive in space. Sounds something straight out of a superhero movie, does it? Well, the space suit is pretty close. You can think of a spacesuit as a wearable one-person spacecraft, actually. Today's spacesuits are referred to as EMUs or Extravehicular Mobility Unit. This means that EMUs are essential, especially when astronauts are outside their respective spacecraft. Now, let's talk about some features of a spacesuit. Outside of the Earth, astronauts face some of the harshest living conditions which would not be survivable without spacesuits. Spacesuits have internal cooling and heating systems to keep internal temperatures from dipping and spiking extremely, as is the case in space. Spacesuits are also equipped to supply astronauts with oxygen, the air that humans breathe, because it is absent in space. Spacesuits also contain hydration packs to help keep astronauts from being thirsty while outside their spacecraft. Spacesuits are also designed to protect astronauts from impact with small space debris, not to mention it keeps away harmful space radiation from being in contact with the astronauts' bodies. The spacesuit's helmet is equipped with a special visor to protect astronauts' eyes from extreme lighting conditions in space. The spacesuit consists of several different parts. The hard upper torso is responsible for covering most of the chest area. There's also the arm assembly that covers the arms and serves as connection for the gloves. Then there's the helmet and the extravehicular visor assembly that is used as head covering and protection. The special visor allows astronauts to see better in space. And then you have the lower torso assembly, which covers the legs and feet. Inside the suit are several layers of material. Each layer has a specific function, like keeping oxygen inside the suit, protecting the outer suit from impacts and protecting against radiation. Underneath the layers is a special liquid cooling and ventilation garment to keep temperatures at normal levels. At the back is the primary life support subsystem. This is like a backpack that contains oxygen for breathing. At the same time, this apparatus also removes carbon dioxide and also provides electricity to the suit. And finally, there's also the simplified aid for extravehicular activity or SAFER, which is a system of small jet thrusters attached to the suit. Astronauts can use it to fly back to the space station or spacecraft if separated. Star Chart Did you know that many ancient civilizations relied on the stars for navigation? They used what was called a star chart or star map. A star chart or star map is a map of the position of stars in the night sky. They are usually divided into grids to make navigation and management easier for travelers. The star charts use stars and other visible heavenly bodies as reference points for location and navigation. A great example reference point is the Northern Star or Polaris, used as a reference to the direction of north. Because of the close proximity of the position of Polaris to the North Celestial Pole. Star charts have been around since ancient times, and nobody is really sure when people started using them. One of the oldest surviving star charts is a 32,500 year old mammoth dust carving 
that was discovered in Germany in 1979. The carving on the tusk resembled the constellation of Orion. Another early example of a star chart can be found in a cave drawing in the Lascaux Caves of France. The Nebra Sky Disk, on the other hand, is a wide bronze disk dating back to 1600 BC and contains a star chart with the moon, the sun, and stars. As time went on, Human civilization and knowledge has progressed to a point where ancient astronomers developed the ability to plot more accurate star charts. One of the earliest accurate star charts dates back to 1534 BC in Egypt. The Babylonians also have their own star charts dating back to 1531 BC. Elsewhere, Chinese astronomers have been keeping records of star positions as early as 476 BC. Star charts have been very instrumental during the period known as the Age of Discovery, a period in between the 15th to 18th century in European history characterized by extensive overseas exploration and expansion. The age of exploration was arguably the beginning of globalization through trade, exploration, mercantilism, and colonialism. The most widely used star charts of the time came from the records of Peter Dirk Zun Kaiser and Frederick de Houtman, two Dutch sailors who traveled to the Dutch East Indies. Another widely used reference was the Oranometria by Johan Beer, which was produced in 1603. Today, GPS and smartphone technology is breathing new life into the use of star charts. Apps and programs are available to anyone who wishes to use star charts for navigation. There are even augmented reality apps that overlay star chart data with current terrain and map data to show users exactly where they are under the stars. Is Pluto a planet? Well, our younger viewers might have not known this, but Pluto was once considered as a full-fledged planet as late as the mid-2000s. But all of this is changed now. So, let's talk about Pluto. Is it a planet? Well, the short answer is no. Let's go back a couple of years in time. Pluto was first discovered in 1930 by an American astronomer named Clyde Tombaugh with the help of the Lowell Observatory in Arizona, officially making Pluto as the ninth planet. This classification of Pluto was upheld till the early 2000s. So, what's changed? In the following decades since its discovery, better telescopes and interplanetary space missions helped identify the Kuiper Belt, a region in space beyond the planet Neptune. The Kuiper Belt contained space debris, asteroids, and dwarf planets, which were still in orbit with the Sun. In 1992, the first Kuiper Belt object, or KBO, was identified as a 1992 QBI. It was detected by David Hewitt from the University of Hawaii. The discovery of the first KBO sparked debates on whether to reclassify Pluto because of its size. Further discoveries of the newer KBOs that are roughly the size or bigger than Pluto pushed the debate for reclassification even further. Finally, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union convened and set up a committee to discuss reclassifying Pluto as a dwarf planet. So what's Pluto like? Pluto is smaller compared to the other planets of the solar system. Its width is only half as large as the width of the whole of the United States, and the whole dwarf planet is smaller than our moon. A year on Pluto is roughly equivalent to 248 Earth years, 
and the day is about six and a half Earth days. Pluto has a very cold temperature because of its distance from the Sun. It also has less gravity because of its smaller mass. The New Horizons spacecraft was the first to take flyby images of Pluto in 2015. And that was another interstellar trip across the universe. Remember to join us next time for another mission to the cosmos and beyond. Only on Inside Outer Space.